on World News Tonight. Intensifying conflict. Russia refuses to back down as it increases the pressure on Ukraine, claiming more and more territory by the minute. However, Ukraine is standing firm despite countless fatal airstrikes. Growing concerns. As the world watches on, President Putin's decisions are under a microscope. However, orders from the top only seem to be growing more rash. Where will Putin draw the line? Find out tonight. Sydney underwater. An unprecedented wave of rainfall has caused what many now call one in a thousand year floods. Rescuers race against time as Mother Nature swallows up large areas of Australia in alarming levels of flood water. Mardi Gras returns. Floats and people alike dressed in flamboyant outfits parade New Orleans streets, celebrating the much needed comeback on street side fun. This is Other Than a World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We begin tonight's broadcast with some grim updates on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Russia is not backing down on pressuring Ukraine as the offensive efforts of the country have now reached a higher threshold. The bombing has now affected key landmarks causing more than just physical damage. Facing growing resistance and mounting logistical setbacks, Russia tonight is unleashing an even more massive and deadly assault against Ukraine. The eastern city of Kharkiv is taking the brunt of it. Ukrainian officials say Russia targeted a government administration building with a missile strike. This was the aftermath near the city's Freedom Plaza. Kharkiv's mayor warning the city is surrounded. Ukraine's President Zelensky accused Russia of targeting civilians, a war crime, and said the barbaric tactics are aimed at pressuring Ukraine to make a deal. Diplomatically, Russia has become a pariah, shunned today at the UN Human Rights Council as delegates walked out during a pre-recorded message by Russia's foreign minister. The Ukrainian military says it's been able to hit back at Russia, including this drone strike on Russian vehicles. But will it be enough for what Russia has prepared? Ukraine's capital is now staring down the barrel of this 40-mile-long convoy closing in, but doing it slowly. A senior U.S. defense official says the convoy is facing fuel and food shortages. So bombs and missiles now are doing most of the dirty work. Ukraine says this is what's left after a Russian airstrike on a military base outside Kiev. And that Russia targeted this TV tower downtown. Russia tonight ominously warning civilians to leave central Kiev, saying it will strike intelligence and communication sites there. The heartbreaking toll of Russia's invasion is growing. Under the rusty pipes are patients who were already in the hospital and need continuous care. These twins, born prematurely. Oleksiy, who had just had a blood transfusion when the bombs started falling. And Nicole, born with complex needs and who requires daily attention. They're holding on, but don't know if the worst has yet to come. UK President Zelensky, however, is not planning to turn tail either, as the leader insisted that cooperation talks can never be had if there isn't a stop to the bombing. Despite this, Ukraine may be on the losing end of the stick as Russian forces have confirmed the capture of Kherson in the south of the country. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says Russia must stop bombarding cities before meaningful ceasefire talks could begin after a first round of negotiations yielded little progress. We are for dialogue, yes, but the least that must happen is the bombardment of people must stop. You simply have to stop the bombardment and then sit down behind the table for talks. The 44-year-old Zelensky, unshaven and clad in a khaki t-shirt and combat boots, made the remarks in an exclusive interview Tuesday with Reuters and CNN in a heavily guarded government compound in Kyiv. Just as he was speaking, news emerged that a Russian missile had struck a TV tower in the Ukrainian capital, killing at least five people. Earlier that day, missiles struck the heart of the eastern city of Kharkiv. Ukraine is receiving weapons shipments from NATO members to help withstand a full-scale military invasion unleashed last week by Russian forces. The West has also introduced severe sanctions on the Russian economy. But Zelensky pressed the international community to do more, including imposing a no-fly zone over his country. As far as a no-fly zone is concerned, it would have helped a lot. 
This is not about dragging NATO countries into war. The truth is, everyone has long since been dragged into war and definitely not by Ukraine, but by Russia. A large-scale war is going on, and everybody thinks it would be over quickly. I talked to President Biden many times. I am very grateful to him for all the opportunities and the support, but they did not hear me. I told them that Ukraine will fight, will fight more than anyone else. But we, just by ourselves, left alone against Russia, we simply cannot manage. But the White House says it is not willing to enforce a no-fly zone, which might put American service members in harm's way. Zelensky said that U.S. President Joe Biden had personally conveyed to him that now was not the time to introduce such a measure. President Zelensky has remained in Kiev to rally his people against the Russian invasion, now in its sixth day posting social media videos and constantly reassuring the population that neither he, his family, or closest officials have left. As the war waged on, hundreds of lawmakers, Ukrainian and Russian protesters, gathered on the steps of the EU parliament in Brussels in a show of solidarity after Russia's invasion on the Ukraine. Let's cross over to other than the world is special correspondent Prashani Rodrigo, who joins us now from Helsinki in Finland. For more, Prashani. Yes, Shanali. The group met after a special plenary session of the parliament dedicated to the crisis during which Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky made an impassioned plea for support from the EU, a day after they made a formal request to join the bloc. The protesters brandished placards reading Europe help Ukraine and we stand with Ukraine and the gathering ended with the Ukrainian anthem. The EU has committed to financing the delivery of weapons to Ukraine in a break with past policy, but some of the protesters called on them to go further. Anastasia, a data analyst from Bila Tsveka, said the country needs all support that Russia may be a huge but may be huge, but Ukraine is worth fighting for as well. She ended her statement with a plea for help. Scores of Russians also attended the pro protests. Citizens of Russia express their views, stating they just want this war to stop, as they have friends and family in Ukraine. Russians themselves don't want this happening. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent, Prashani Rodrigo, reporting from Helsinki in Finland. Meanwhile, President Vladimir Putin getting more criticism than ever before, as insiders suspect possible clouded judgment from the leader as the world watches what moves he makes next with growing concerns. Putin himself keeps up the offense. Vladimir Putin tonight, frustrated and angry with the pace of his assault on Ukraine. The worry for Washington, is he acting rationally and will he ramp up the violence against Ukraine's citizens? There is no new intelligence on his mental state. But U.S. officials say everyone, including President Biden, sees an angrier Putin, increasingly detached from reality in his speeches, isolated from longtime advisors, rarely coming into the Kremlin, and when he does, meeting on opposite ends of a supersized table, more than 20 feet apart. Officials tell him Putin has lashed out at underlings in private and in public bullied his top spy on state TV. Say it directly, he said. Now he's raising the stakes for U.S. military planners by putting Russia's nuclear forces on heightened alert, with the Russian economy collapsing under the weight of global sanctions and some of his own oligarchs even criticizing the invasion. What might he do to stay in power? He can threaten or carry out cyber attacks against the West, including the United States, and he can threaten uh, to use uh, uh, battlefield nuclear weapons. Over in the United States now, as President Joe Biden sharply criticized Russian Pre President Vladimir Putin and led a standing ovation for the embattled Ukrainian people in the State of the Union speech that he rewrote to address Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. Biden said in his address that Putin was wrong and they were ready. He stood in the chamber of the House of Representatives for his first formal State of the Union speech, looking to reset his presidency after a first year in office marked by rapid economic growth and trillion of dollars in new programs but beset by the highest inflation in 40 years and a lingering coronavirus pandemic. Biden had some progress to tout. The economy grew faster than it has since 1984 with 6.6 .6 million jobs created. The government distributed hundreds of millions of COVID-19 vaccines and he has nominated the first black woman to serve on as Supreme Court. 
Battling rising inflation exacerbated by the Russian crisis and assailed by Republicans who accused him of allowing it to get out of control. U.S. Biden pitched a plan to increase wages and lower inflation in his speech, calling for companies to make more cars and semiconductors in the United States so Americans would be less reliant on imports. It isn't just diplomatic leaders that are bowing out from the conflict initiating country, but industry heads too, as technology giants such as Apple and Ford have decided to walk away from operations in the country while also restricting the flow of its products within the Russian market. Apple said it has stopped sales of iPhones and other products in Russia, joining a growing list of major U.S. companies who are shunning the country after President Vladimir Putin ordered an invasion of Ukraine. Fellow tech giant Google dropped Russian state publishers from its news. Ford told its Russian manufacturing partner it was suspending operations in the country. And Harley-Davidson halted its business in Russia and stopped all shipments of bikes there. And earlier on Tuesday, the world's biggest shipping lines, Swiss-based MSC and Denmark's Maersk, suspended container shipping to and from Russia, deepening the country's isolation. The moves mean that Russia, supplier of one-sixth of all commodities, is now effectively cut off from a large chunk of the globe's shipping capacity. The steady drumbeat of companies taking a stance against Russia increased during the day as rockets struck major cities in Ukraine. Nike also made merchandise purchases on its website and app unavailable in the country as it said it cannot guarantee delivery of goods. The global reaction has turned Russia in a matter of weeks into a financial pariah. With a central bank hamstrung by sanctions, major banks shut out of the international payment system, and capital controls choking off money flows. Hollywood, too, is joining the Russia rejection, with Paramount Pictures on Tuesday the latest studio to announce it is halting all film distribution in the country. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. With Ukraine and Russia battling each other, it seems that Australia has had to battle Mother Nature. And quite fiercely at that too, as unprecedented floods consume the entirety of the country. These so-called one-in-a-thousand-year floods have had citizens grappling for what little they have left. Clinging to rooftops, waiting for help. Australians across the East Coast have faced its worst floods on record. In the northern city of Lismore in New South Wales, locals have watched their streets become totally engulfed by flood water. And it's coming for Sydney. Authorities have warned the city to brace for heavy rain and possible flash flooding over the next two days. The Bureau of Meteorology predicted the city and several neighbouring regions could get up to six inches within a six hour period on Tuesday. That's more than the total of what the city usually experiences in the month of March. At least 10 people have been killed in Australia since the rain battered the state of New South Wales as well as Queensland last week with floods submerging towns and roads. New South Wales Premier Dominic Perrottet warned residents in the state south to get ready to leave their homes immediately if they are asked. Australia's east coast summer has been dominated by the La Nina climate pattern which is typically associated with greater rainfall for a second straight year. America is moving on from restricted lives, it seems, as President Biden has introduced a brand new test to treat initiatives that may seem significant changes within the number of daily infections in the country, while also dropping mask mandates for most facilities. To get more details on this, we have other than a World News Special Correspondent Nicola Sena Ratna, who joins us from New York in the United States. Nicola. Yes, Shanali. U.S. President Joe Biden said his administration has launched a new initiative that will allow Americans to get tested for COVID-19 at a pharmacy and receive free pills if they are tested positive. Biden said during the State of the Union speech that they are launching the Test to Treat initiative in which people can get tested at a pharmacy and if they are tested positive, they can receive antiviral pills in the spot at no cost. 
Biden said the United States has ordered more of these pills than any other country in the world. Adding Pfizer Incorporated offer to US 1 million pills in March and more than double in April. The Pfizer pill, he said, will reduce the chances of ending up in the hospital by 90%. The White House previously stated that it is lifting requirements that fully vaccinated individuals wear masks on the White House campus. It is also told federal agencies that they can drop COVID-19 requirements that employees and visitors wear masks in federal buildings in much of the country. Back to you, Shanali. Thank you. And that was Adhidhar Nawalny, Special Correspondent Nicola Sena Ratna, reporting from New York in the United States. Now, in the opposite end of the spectrum is currently happening in New Zealand as thousands have amassed in the country's capital to put an end to the vaccine mandates as well as all pandemic-related restrictions. New Zealand police clashed with anti-COVID vaccine protesters on Wednesday as authorities moved to tow away cars and take down tents set up outside parliament. Some packed up and left. Others stayed to fight. Fires broke out, sending up pillars of smoke that police moved to put out. Police say officers unleashed pepper spray, while protesters wielded fire extinguishers and pitchforks as weapons. The demonstrations have disrupted the country's capital, Wellington, for the past three weeks. And on Wednesday morning, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern said it was time to leave. Those protesters illegally occupying parliament grounds and surrounding streets have been given ample opportunity to leave. It is time for them to go. As the police commissioner said this morning, it's time to clear the roads and restore order for Wellingtonians. It will be obvious to those who work in and around parliament that the protest has been at times violent and increasingly fueled by misinformation and sadly conspiracy theories. First inspired by a truckers demonstration in Canada last month, groups started calling for an end to all pandemic restrictions. One protester who told she was unvaccinated said, quote, We are fighting for our standard of life. We want our sovereign right to our bodies. Police said on Wednesday that 60 protesters have been arrested and at least three officers were injured. Some 95 percent of eligible people in New Zealand are vaccinated with two doses. Burkina Faso is set to be a militia-governed country for the next three years. The handover followed by a lengthy debate on the transitional charter. The junta behind a coup in Burkina Faso has been authorized to hold power for three years, according to a charter signed in the early hours of Tuesday. It was approved at a national conference and will establish a transitional government made up of 25 ministers and a 71-member parliament. But the move potentially sets the West African country on a collision course with international partners, who have urged a speedy return to constitutional order. The charter was signed by coup leader Lieutenant Colonel Paul-Henri Demiba, who is now interim president. Soldiers seized power in January, blaming President Rock Kabore for failing to contain a surge in militant violence. It was the fourth West African coup in 18 months, following two in Mali and one in Guinea. That raised concerns of a democratic backslide in the region. But political leader Salam Sawadogo welcomed the charter. Burkina Faso was suspended from regional bloc ECOWAS and the African Union's decision-making bodies after the coup. Both declined to impose additional sanctions, and ECOWAS said in early February that the junta had shown willingness to work with it to organize elections. An African Union spokesperson referred requests for comments on the three-year transition to ECOWAS. ECOWAS did not respond. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz visited the Yad Vashem Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem with Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett. Scholz and Bennett toured the museum's Hall of Names and laid a read at the Hall of Remembrance, where an internal flame is lit in commemoration of the six million Jews killed by the Nazis in World War II. 
Global supply chains already hit hard by the pandemic face new disruption and cost pressure as aircrafts banned following Russia's invasion of Ukraine raise concerns over a fifth of the air freight. Just over a week after testing positive for COVID-19, Queen Elizabeth II felt well enough to take part in two virtual audiences following a number of cancellations of similar events last week. Firefighters have been battling back blazes in Valparaiso with the region now on red alert over raging wildfires. Local officials say strong winds in the area are fooling the movement of the fires, which are concerning hundreds of hectares of land. Hyundai Motor is reporting sales in the United States last month at a record high for the month of February in terms of vehicle units. Hyundai Motors that sales for retail buyers were up 19% on the year at almost 52,500 units. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight with views of Mardi Gras being celebrated to its fullest after coming back from a pandemic break. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.